General Linear Models Part 3. GLMs with a categorical predictor. So when do you use categorical GLMs? You use it when you have a categorical predictor and you want to predict a numeric outcome. But usually we don't say it like that. Usually we say that we are interested in seeing how groups differ on some numeric outcome. Predict with a categorical variable on outcome versus look at how groups differ on a numeric outcome. But really statistics doesn't care how you think about it or what you call it, because either way it's the same thing. So predicting the outcome with gender is the same as seeing how males and females differ on the outcome. So some examples of questions we might ask. How do males and females differ in their emotional intelligence? Or you could say, how does gender predict emotional intelligence? How different in depression are those who receive therapy? Or how does therapy predict depression? Or life satisfaction for mothers versus non-mothers? Or you could say, how does mother status predict satisfaction? In each of these cases, we have a categorical or a grouping predictor variable and an outcome that is numeric. So let's do a real data example, shall we? So I don't think it's any secret that I wanna be a world famous author. Buy my book on Amazon for 99 cents. Can you say conflict of interest? Can you say suck it? When I was writing my first novel, I wasn't sure if I wanted to go traditional publishing versus self-publishing. And there are pros and cons to both. So with traditional, you have people helping you with publicity, kinda sorta. You have designers for the book cover. You have an editor, but they take a pretty massive cut of your sales and they own the rights to your book forever and always. That didn't really sit well with me, but if it made me more money, who cares? Versus self-publishing. You get a higher percentage of the earnings, you own the book. Now you are in charge of editing, typesetting, book cover design, etc., etc. Oh, and publicity. So I wanted to know which way is financially more advantageous. Because I want to roll in the dough, y'all. And it just so happens that there are lots of others who have the same question. So a couple fellas got together and compiled what we call the Amazon dataset. And I will talk more later about how the Amazon dataset came into existence. Just as before, we're gonna follow the same four steps. Visualize univariates, visualize the bivariates, look at the diagnostics, and finally look at the estimates. So first step, visualize the univariate data. So on the right, we have the distribution of publisher, big five, which represents the top five biggest publishing houses like Random House and I can never remember the other ones. I just remember Random House. Relative to Amazon self-publishing. At least at the time this data set was made, big five published books were a lot more prolific than were Amazon published books. Though that's probably changed since then. Technical side note for the pedantic, this data set consists of the top 50,000 books sold on Amazon. So that just tells you within the top 50 slots, big five dominates. At least with this data set. But then if we look at the income, holy moly, patoly goly, we got some serious problems. That looks really zero inflated. But what does it mean? That means that most authors are making absolutely nothing. Oh man, I really wanted to be world famous and stuff. And that actually kind of sort of makes sense. Sales fluctuate wildly. When a book is first released, there's lots of sales and then it just kind of withers and dies. That's the publishing way and that's why I have a day job and make YouTube videos. Although I'm not getting any money, so am I having a midlife crisis? Where are my priorities? Back to the data. So again, most of these books are making nothing because they're old. But what I wanna know is if I release my book tomorrow when it's brand new, how much can I expect to make using traditional versus self-published? And by the way, we know that it's severely skewed because JK Rowling's up in there. And I think at the time that I got this data set, Stephanie Meyer was kind of a big deal. So maybe she's up there too. So what I decided to do was eliminate all those who are making nothing because I'm not interested in those people because those have old books. Again, I want to know how much I'm going to make tomorrow. Once I have eliminated those who are making nothing, let's go ahead and visualize the bivariate relationships. And by the way, you already know how to do these. But again, that JK Rowling is messing up our data set. Will you just stop writing books so I can analyze my data? Actually, please don't. I love you and adore you and I want to see a hundred more Harry Potter books. And so this graphic, we can't really tell anything because it's so zoomed out because people are making $15,000 a day. I would give my left arm and my right arm to make $15,000 a day. So just so we can see the pattern a little bit easier, I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in on the zero to 100 range. And holy persnickety, Amazon's on top. But things are still pretty skewed, but that's okay. That's informative. That tells me that self-publishing through Amazon, so far it seems to be the better way to go. But of course, we've gotta look at the diagnostics and we know those are gonna be shot. And so here they are. Again, we already know how to interpret these. We don't have to worry about linearity because we got a categorical predictor, but we do see that we got problems. The residuals are very far from normally distributed. 
So even if you remove those who have zero, we still have something that looks like zero inflated data. With the SL plot, it's kind of hard to tell because the scale goes from zero to 15,000, but we do have some problems with heteroscedasticity. And at this point, we shouldn't move on until we have fixed the model and found a model that is actually more appropriate, like a zero inflated model or something and see the link in the description for how to do that. And what I'm gonna do is actually in the background, I'm going to fix some of these problems and report the results of the fixed way of doing things using robust methods that kind of sort of fix the problem, but not entirely. It'd be better to do generalized linear models, but let's not get overly technical. So pretending everything is okay, let's go ahead and look at our estimates now. When we have categorical on numeric, there are a few estimates we are really interested in, such as the differences between groups and their corresponding confidence intervals, the means of each group and those confidence intervals, and Cohen's D. So what is the mean difference? Or put differently, how much more money can I expect to make if I go through Amazon versus going through the big five? $17.46, with a confidence interval between $16.40 and $18.53. And what is the mean for each group? Or how much should I expect to make if I go through Amazon versus if I go through the big five? And here I am computing prediction intervals instead of confidence intervals because I am interested in how much money I will make. For Amazon, the mean is $33 with a prediction interval between $3 and $63. And with the big five, it's $15 with a prediction interval between negative $14 and $45 which actually isn't possible in this sort of example to lose money, but you get the idea. And what is Cohen's D? Negative 0.43. But I would treat this value with extreme caution because there are so many outliers and that sort of thing, and they really screw up Cohen's D. And of course, we could also compute a p-value if we were interested and if we are in strict CDA mode, which I wasn't, but just for your edification, with caveats included, <laughs> and a shiver to indicate my disgust for this approach. With such a massive data set, the p-value is actually really super tiny, which gives some evidence that the difference between the groups is not equal to zero, but I don't really care about that. I wanna know how much money I'm gonna make. Conclusions from this data set? Yeah, if you wanna be rich, being an author isn't the way to do it. Most new releases make well under $60 a day, and that's only for a limited time. Can't really support a family on $60 a day, can ya? By the way, is this not like super powerful information? Up until we had this data set, we had to just kind of guess, but now we know. Kind of, sort of, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. So what did I do? I published on Amazon. Buy my book, please, I got four children. So how exactly is this a general linear model? By the way, the next section is a slightly advanced topic. Feel free to skip this if you want to because the computer will handle all this in the background for you. So you remember the GLM outcome is equal to intercept plus slope times predictor plus E, or daily income is equal to intercept plus slope times big five plus E. Now, hold on a minute, what just happened? All we did was create a new variable called big five, which simply indicates whether that particular book was published by the big five or not. So we put a one for yes and a zero for no. The technical term for this is to zero-fy things. Okay, only I call it zero-fying things. And so by indicating one for those books that are the big five, that by default says that any books labeled zero is an Amazon book. And so you remember the intercept means the expected value of Y or the outcome, given that X is equal to zero. Well, in this case, X is equal to are you big five or not? And so if you are not big five, that makes you Amazon. So the intercept now means the mean of Amazon. And the slope, remember it means how much Y changes when you change an X by one point point. Well, X in this case means, are you a big five book? And so in this case, it represents going from Amazon, zero, to big five, one. The slope will tell you how much your income changes when you go from Amazon to the big five. Or the slope is just the difference in means between the two groups. So here's a visual to help illustrate that. So on the X axis, we have zero, or the Amazon group, and one, or the big five group. And if we were to plot a line, the y-intercept represents the mean of the Amazon group, and then the slope, or the difference between the Amazon group and the big five group is negative $17.46. 
and advanced topicness. Under the old way of doing things, we would call this a t test. A t test is used when you have two groups and you want to estimate the probability of the difference that we obtain belonging to a null distribution where the groups are exactly equal. So the old way of using a t test was much less focused on visuals, much less focused on estimates, much less focused on means or even mean differences. And the focus was on decision making using probabilities, which wouldn't be very appropriate in this example because I just want to know how much money I'm going to make. But the t-test only works if you have exactly two groups. Whereas with a general linear model, it doesn't care how many groups you have, but there is some additions we need to do in the background. And it also means we just have more estimates to compute. And we will visit that in the next video. So now, once again, in the words of Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. So it turns out that the data set I was using wasn't entirely trustworthy. Long story short, there was this mystical creature online who kept his identity anonymous by the name of Data Guy. And this Data Guy thought pretty highly of himself. And so what he did was he asked a bunch of author friends who were in the top charts in Amazon how much they were making and how many books they sold and that sort of thing. From that, he was able to somehow map Amazon's rankings with how many books each author was selling. Then he used that sort of mapping to project what happens for all of Amazon's data. And this was all fine and good and useful until Data Guy started selling this information to publishers. So how would you feel if you were one of those authors willingly giving this Data Guy your information about how many books you sell and then he goes and invades your privacy? Not cool, Data Guy. Not cool. And then at that point, people started getting suspicious and started getting angry and they started finding all sorts of errors with this guy's data set. Like things just didn't line up. And in the comment section of the blog post that he posted this, people started asking about his credentials. And he said, Hey, if you guys had any idea how awesome my credentials are, you would laugh at yourself for even asking. That is not a direct quote, but that's pretty close to what he actually said. Needless to say, when I offered to perform an analysis, he never got back to me. Yeah, I saw your analysis data guy and it sucked. How's that for self-publishing gossip? So with that, let's review our learning objectives. Number one, know the old name for categorical GLMs, which in this case is a t-test if you have exactly two groups. Number two, know how to visualize categorical on numeric relationship. And you guys already know this, it's just median dot plots. Number three, know how to assess assumptions or diagnostics using categorical GLMs. Y'all know how to do that, you're good. At least you advanced users. Number five, know what each estimate represents. Again, the intercept is the mean of the referent group. And by the way, the referent group is usually chosen somewhat arbitrarily by by statistical software packages. And the slope is the difference between the two groups. And Cohen's D, it's just the same as it was before. And finally, know what it means to zero-fy your data, which again means to convert a categorical variable into a numeric variable by creating a new variable that is just zero, one, indicating which group they belong to. Next time, we will talk about situations where you have three plus groups. Until then, peace out.